I do some consulting work on the American feeling Indian in the room issues. Was you don't ever say to her that her point about the Chicago incident. This is a great discussion on the ethical we left. Left. more of a community. We're trying to back over. doing in autism. On September 15, 1963, a bomb exploded at the 16th Street Baptist Church in Birmingham, Alabama. Five girls were preparing for worship in the basement of the building. Four were killed by the blast, but the fifth girl survived. Twelve-year-old Sarah Collins was hospitalized for months and ultimately lost her right eye to her injuries. Now more than 50 years after that tragic event, Sarah Collins Rudolph still suffers from residual effects of the explosion, yet is often overlooked in the larger discussions of the bombing and its role in energizing the civil rights movement. We'll talk with her about living in the shadows of that historic tragedy, about delayed justice, and about today's most pressing civil rights struggles. Here's our conversation with Sarah Collins Rudolph. Sarah Collins Rudolph, welcome to the program. Thank you. You know, most Americans know the story of the four little girls who were killed on September 15, 1963, in the 16th Street Baptist Church. Uh, but fewer know that there was actually a fifth little girl who survived, and of course that's you. Yeah. Why do you suppose that's the case? You know, uh, when, when, the, when that happened, people weren't saying anything too much about the survivor. Uh, because uh, there was so much going out about the death of the four girls. One of them being your sister? Yes. 14-year-old yes. Addie May. Yes, my sister Addie, because, you know, we were together in the, in the uh, ladies' lounge. In the basement? Yes. What do you remember about that morning? I remember how we walked to church. It was Jane and Addie and, and myself. How we were so happy, and Jane had a little purse. And she was, we was throwing it back and forward to each other. And we had to walk about 17 blocks, and we was having a good time all the way to church that morning. And you were there early. Mass, uh, not mass, but church service began at 11. Uh, but uh, we was, we was uh, trying to get to Sunday school. But uh, when we got to Sunday school, uh, Sunday school was already in session. So uh, we, me and Addie stayed in the uh, ladies' lounge, you know, waiting to... Sunday school turned out, and our uh, Janet class was upstairs. And uh, cause you know, her, by being her age, they had all the senior classes upstairs. And that morning, while I was looking at the door, waiting for our class to start, and I seen the girls come in: Cynthia, Wesley, Denise McNair, and Carol Robson. So they came into the they the other the, girls who were killed that morning. Yes. Yeah, so they came into the lounge and went on back to the other side where the stalls were. And they came out together. Denise was in front and she stopped where Ada was. Ada was standing by the uh, window and I was on the other side of her by the sink. And when she stopped, she asked Ada to tie the sash on her dress. And when Ada reached out to tie it, we stood there looking, but we didn't get a chance to see her tie it. Uh, that's when the bomb went off. You know, there had been literally dozens of bombs in Birmingham, Alabama in the year and a half prior to that event. Were you at all afraid at that point uh, as a child growing up in, in Birmingham, which of course at the time was the most racially uh, segregated and, and discriminatory city in, in the U.S.? Did you have a, a sense of fear? No, I didn't have a sense of fear. I, I remember when uh, they bombed Arthur Shores house. We heard about that. You know, he was a lawyer. And uh, I heard, heard about the bombing in uh, uh, Shuttlesworth Church. And they didn't, didn't nothing happen to them, you know, but uh, when the bombs went off, it looked like it was just something that Birmingham was used to, you know, he and bomb. And uh, by going to church that morning, we didn't, we never did think they would bomb the church up. I just watched uh, the movie, the critically acclaimed movie, Selma, and I have to say that the scene, which is a little bit different than, than what happened in real life, of, of the girls walking down the steps, of course you were actually one of them, um, when that explosion happened, I literally jumped out of my seat and, and so did so many of the people I sitting did. around me. Mm -hmm. um, I, I can't imagine what being there must have been like. 
You, you saw the movie too. What yes. was your reaction to the movie? And what did they get right and what didn't they get right? Well, for one thing, the girls weren't walking down step. That was one. And uh, when the bomb went off, my husband was with me, and we both almost jumped out of our seat because I wasn't expecting that on that scene. But uh, it just really scared us. And I, it, it took me back to that moment, you know, that sound, and it just really scared both of us. You actually spent more than two months in the hospital after that event. Tell us a little bit about the injuries you sustained that morning. Well, when the, when the bomb went off, and I turned to look at uh, Eddie Tan and Denise Sack, and all of a sudden, all the debris just came rushing in. And uh, when, it, when it rushed in, a lot of glass got in my face and, and my eyes. And they was uh, able to, search, to save my left eye, but I, I was blind incident in my right eye and had so many pieces of glasses in my face. The doctor had said it was about 26 pieces of glass that in my face that was in my eye together. There's a heartbreaking photograph of you in the hospital. You have two patches over your eyes. And I understand that you didn't know right away that your sister Addie died, nor did you know at the time that you actually lost that the vision completely in that one eye and that, that uh, your right eye was removed. Yeah. Yeah, I, I didn't know. I didn't know they was, the girls was killed. But that's all. By me uh, being blind instant, and I didn't, and they came and uh, took me out of the church because when the bomb went off, I called Addie three times. By three times, I called her name, but she didn't answer. So the first thing I thought about, maybe they had ran on the on the other side where the Sunday school area was. But I found out later when I uh, arrived at the hospital, Janie was there, my, my other sister. And, and Janie? I, yeah, and I asked her, I said, where's Addie? And she said that Addie hurt her back, but she was gonna come and see me tomorrow. So I guess she didn't wanna get me upset that Addie had, was killed. So. Uh, she was talking to somebody while I was laying on, on, the, on the couch because they told me the eye doctor wasn't there. So while I was laying there waiting on the doctor, that's when I heard her say, tell the nurse somebody, she said one of my sister got killed. And you just mom. overheard it? Yeah, overheard it. That's how I found out. So when they got through operating on my eye, that's when I uh, went back upstairs to my room. My mother was there. She let me know that all the girls were killed. I was the only one to survive that. Although there wasn't, uh, we didn't know of such a thing as post-traumatic stress disorder. You, you certainly have suffered from post-traumatic stress disorder as a result of that. Yes, I have. You know, uh, when I would hear loud sounds, I just jump. You know, and uh, that's something that I still have. And uh, it seemed like if I turn water on, if it rush out too fast, I jumps and all that is is still in me. And uh, it's just something that look like I I just I would never get over it, but I hope one day I will. I, I'm wondering what it's felt like all these fifty plus years to have in some respects been in the shadow of the girls who died. Has that been yeah. difficult? Yes, in a way, it 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 it, it hurts because uh, I still live it. You know, when I put makeup on, and I still remember it. And when I look in the mirror, prosthetic eyes, I still remember. It. You know, something like that you can't forget when you have the injuries on you, and you had to see it every day. You actually have flashbacks. Yeah, it's always take me back just knowing. I'm putting this on because of what somebody did to me. You bombed the church, and uh, it looked like somebody I'd never forget. One of the, the biggest tragedies is that, despite the fact that the FBI actually had information about, about who the perpetrators of this 
a heinous crime was, they kept it to themselves. Uh, and no one was prosecuted until 1977, when Robert Shambliss finally was prosecuted for the murder of these four girls and went to jail, didn't serve long enough. He was sentenced to life, but, but died eight years later, mm -hmm. and as far as I'm concerned, got out easy. Um, mm -hmm. yeah. Was that some closure for you, that finally there was some justice in 1977? You know, at first, uh, I really wasn't satisfied about them uh, waiting so long to have his trial because they lived their life and they lived it, but the girls, you know, they didn't, they didn't get a chance to live their life out. So I felt like since the FBI and all the city officials knew about it, they should have put them on trial right then and there because uh, uh, they lived a, a, a ham doing what they wanted to do. So the girls didn't get that chance. And in fact, two of the perpetrators weren't convicted until 2000 and 2000, 2001 and 2002. So mm -hmm. they were decades living free yeah. before they finally served. A fourth one died before he could go to trial. And I think one of the, the biggest tragedies is that your mother never, she died before anyone was convicted of these crimes. Yes. And, they, and, that, and, and that was 38 years later. And one of them, Cherry tried to get out of here by saying he was too sick, but... Robert they, Cherry. Uh, yeah. Bobby Cherry. Yeah, Bobby. Bobby Frank Cherry. And uh, he was he was playing as though he was too sick to go to trial, but they took him to Bryce, and they found out he could go to trial because, you know, every time I would see him, he would have a pack, whole pack of pills in his hand, and he was saying he wasn't able, but... I was glad they went on and They, they were saying that he was psychologically not capable to stand right, trial. Right, mm -hmm. But he would because they found him. And they, uh, when they uh, sent him to Bryce, they found out he was able. Yeah. Another tragedy of all of this is that to this day, you do not know where your sister, Addie Mae Collins, is buried. You right. wanted to move her, uh, her casket from one cemetery to another. And mm -hmm. when she was exhumed, t tell us what happened and, and why you don't know where she is. Oh, well, you know, uh, the reason why we didn't know, because, you know, after the funeral, they had three funerals out there in one, one day. And, and it was and, a lot of people. And Martin Luther King uh, did a eulogy. Did, did the eulogy, did mm -hmm. the sermon, the funeral sermon. But anyway, uh, we, by so many people was out there that day, you know, Jane and them couldn't remember, but the only, th only thing she would remember, her, cat, her, her remain was by a tree. They buried her uh, close to a tree, so, uh, and we wanted to move her because I would come out there before they dedicated this uh, headstone because they told us that it was a cross indicating where she was located. And this, this man, he had been going out there just seeing a cross out there, so he decided to, to get her a more, more, a more semi headstone. So when they moved, exhumed it, it was somebody under it had false teeth. So you knew, obviously, this was not your 14-year-old sister right. with false teeth. Right, and and we wanted to move to a mausoleum called the funeral. I mean, the cemetery was not kept up. I went out there one day, had old broke down lawn and the grass was gr growing real tall, and we decided we'll move her into a mo mother limb, but I had the papers all ready to uh, fix her up. And then the lady called us. She was out there interviewing people at magazine. She she called us. She said, well, the man said that Ed is not here. You're someone with false teeth, and that was so shocking to to know I had been going out there putting flowers out there and found out I was putting flowers on somebody with false teeth. And that, that really hurt. Today, if someone experienced what you experienced, there would be a victim's compensation fund. When, when this happened to you, not only in some ways were, were you f overshadowed by the death of the four girls, but it, it sounds like in some ways you had to deal with the repercussions of this on your own. Yes. Yes, I did. 
you know, like we was talking about, uh, did no one say anything about the, the one that survived. But when I got old enough, I began to uh, go to places like to see could I get victim compensation for added death and my injuries. And people say, well, you know, that happened in 63. So, we, you know, we can't do nothing about that. And it was really, really shocking. Here I am paying bills for the injury they did to, to me. Because for, for years I had glaucoma in my left eye. And so you, you were at risk of total blindness? Yes. And uh, the doctor said that I had still have a piece of glass in my uh, left eye, but they don't want to remove it because I just have one eye. And uh, all this, I got to pay these bills on my own. And I was taking drops for, for so many years for this glaucoma. And uh, after a while, the doctor said that now the drop's not doing any good. And, and he was going to have to just cut an incision in my eye for the fluid to uh, drain out. To relieve and, the pressure in your yeah, eye. Yeah, uh, and yes. And uh, I had that done. And he still told me that I had a, have a cataract, too. And right now, all, he wants to just try glasses, different types, you know, that strengthen that uh, uh, eye. Because he still don't want to just mess with it because he don't want me to go blind in it. So he said, until then, that's what they was going to do. You were an A student before this happened. Yes. And you had ambitions to become a nurse when you graduated high school. Yes. Um, how did this explosion change your, your life's path? Well, it changed a lot because, you know, a, a, a bombing like that, you don't never be the same. You, I don't, uh, I didn't really uh, study and feel like that because I was always so nervous and so fearful. I just couldn't do it because it changed my life and I was sickened by added death. And I, I, didn't, I didn't become a, a nurse. So I, what I did, I began to get jobs like in into a uh, foundry. I did foundry work. Factory work. Yeah. And uh, also, I worked in one foundry. It was in uh, three years. Then I worked in another foundry for 14 years. And uh, it just changed my whole life, really. We have heard, you know, so many in the movie uh, Selma and in Spike Lee's documentary Four Little Girls, this incident on February, on September 15th, 1963, is referred to as a turning point, as, as having energized the civil rights movement, as having uh, created a consciousness among white Americans uh, that nothing else prior to that could have. And I I'm wondering how you feel about that. And I, and I want to also add that the Reverend Jesse Jackson said, we transformed a crucifixion into a resurrection. But from where you're sitting, what, what does that feel like? Well, I, I know those girls uh, did things to change, but it was just a shame that those young girls had to die like that. Because the only thing we was uh, uh, trying to get was our uh, rights. And they had to take death to get it. And little girls didn't, uh, grow up to be what they want to be, you know, I, it kind of hurts. It really does, because they didn't have to die like that for things to go right in Birmingham. The reason Martin Luther King and SNCC descended on uh, Birming Birmingham was because of the rampant discrimination in that city, and I'm wondering if you and your family or any members of your family were involved in the movement at the time. Yes, my mother would. My mother would go to the, to the movement uh, meetings every Wednesday, and I remember her always going. She didn't miss a meeting. And, and they were held in, in the, the very church where the, mm -hmm. the bomb yeah. exploded. Yes, and uh, we would stay home by ourselves, and she would go to the meeting. She was very, very uh, uh, interested in marching, and, and uh, she wanted our rights, because it, Birmingham wasn't right 
you know, uh, when when you when you're in Birmingham at that time, if we needed a policeman, call a policeman, we couldn't you get a policeman, cause they was against us. One third were known to be Klansmen. Yeah. Uh huh. Yeah. And fire department, people in the fire department, they put the water hose on the people. The dogs, they th put the dogs on the on the marches. Uh, and the only thing we wanted to do, we wanted to change that. We we wanted to go into the stores and buy our clothes and try our clothes on. They didn't let us try our clothes on, but we can buy it. And then uh, uh, we couldn't try the shoes on. Our mother had to get a marker and mark our feet size on a piece of paper and then go and buy shoes for us. Yeah, we wanted all that changed because if, if uh, we were, we was feeling like we weren't even human beings. You know, we had we we couldn't use the restroom. We had uh, we couldn't even use the, the uh, 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 hydrant to get water. You know, to, they got black water, white water signs on that, and we wanted all that change. What is Birmingham, Alabama, like today? Well, things have changed. Uh, I have seen a lot of changes in Birmingham. All the signs are down. And now we can, you know, get things we want. We don't have to uh, go to Wonders. We can use the same restroom. A lot of things have changed. If you were to pinpoint what you see as uh, the most pressing civil rights issue of today, what would you say it is? I still see uh, some of the, uh, maybe some of the, 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 the police might be strict, but. I really haven't noticed it because I hadn't yet uh, stopped. They hadn't stopped me driving or anything, but uh, maybe that's probably it. And and uh, maybe something concerning the uh, our mayor. Maybe things like that. When we go to our mayor, we try to let them know what what happened. And people, they're not really concerned. That's about it. But uh, other than that. Uh, Birmingham had really changed a lot. The three men who were ultimately convicted of this crime, uh, only one is still living. And he, like the other two, continues, despite overwhelming evidence, continues to deny that he was involved in this. And, and yet there's evidence uh, that they planted a, uh, something in the neighborhood of 122 sticks of dynamite under that church. Have any, has anyone reached out to you, and would there be more closure if someone apologized for this? Oh uh, yes, um, my uh, husband reached out to Blanton. He, the, uh, Thomas Blanton, he's the only one who's still living and yeah. in, in jail, in prison. So when he, when she, he wrote the letter, the first thing he said that he didn't do it. He said it was the man, the man that killed Viola Larusso. It was that person, and I haven't had anybody to apologize. I went to the court with all of them—Robert uh, Chamberlain, Thomas Bradley, and Cherry—but uh, they never said they ever said they apologized. Remarkably, from what I'm reading, you have forgiven them, and, and forgiveness is—you know—I think it can be defined different ways by different people. So. I'm curious to know, what does forgiveness mean to you? I went on to forgive them because uh, I didn't want to hold uh, forgiveness in me because they said when you hold, hold it on the inside, you begin to When you to hold get the anger and the yeah, hate. Yeah, yeah. And uh, they said, you know, don't but get sick, different uh, uh, things like arthritis. These sickness come on you, so I don't want that to come up on me because I'm holding on, on to it. But uh, one thing, I can forgive them, but you know, like I was telling you earlier, I can't forget simply because when I look in the mirror and see what they've done to me, it's always a reminder of that day. What has it meant to you to finally share your story? There was a fifth girl there, and that fifth girl is Sarah Collins Rudolph. Well, it, it, it meant a lot because I was there and uh, I believe God left me there to be a witness because many people for, for years were saying that these young girls was in there putting on their sick robes, getting ready for the youth service, and that wasn't what it was. 
It was just the fact that they class just turned out and they just went to the restroom. It was just had, another day, mm -hmm. another Sunday school mm -hmm. that forever changed all of your lives. It did. Yes, it did. And uh, and it was wrong for them to put a bomb on the on the 16th Street Baptist Church and kill those girls because they was innocent, sweet girls. All of them was very sweet and kill them. Finally, what what did all of this do to your faith in God? I I believe it it, it made my faith stronger because when the bomb went off, I called on the Lord. And I really believe, since I had that opportunity to call on him, he came and he saved me, simply for that purpose, because where those girls were standing, that's where they placed the bomb. But he had me on the other side of the church right by the water, and he saved me to you know, let people know what really happened that day. Sarah Collins Rudolph, thank you so much for talking with us. Thank you for having me. I hope you enjoyed our conversation with Sarah Collins Rudolph. For more information about the 16th Street Church bombing, visit our website at conversations.psu.edu. I'm Patty Satalia. We hope you'll join us for our next Conversation from Penn State. Production funding provided in part by the Corporation for Public Broadcasting and by viewers like you. Thank you. This has been a production of WPSU.